Hello, and welcome back to Stuck in the Middle Kingdom with you. I'm Adam, an English teacher who went to China in 2014 and taught English in a small city near Shanghai. This podcast tells the story of my troubled first year, so if you're new to the show, I'd encourage you to start at the beginning. That said, alongside the main story, many episodes focus much more on other issues about Chinese history and culture, and you don't really need to be following the story to listen to that part. Okay, on with the show. Easter was here, and it was up to me to explain to 28 kids who spoke another language that a man called Jesus hatched out of an egg, and the midwife was a rabbit. And lo, as a result, every year we celebrate this miracle by colouring eggs, eating chocolate rabbits. Eggs in weird stories are not unknown to the Chinese school child, for one egg in particular played a central role in the creation of the universe, no less. This is the story of Pangu. At the beginning, there was nothing but darkness, chaos. After a while, some chaos gathered together, forming an egg. The egg glowed, brighter and brighter, until it finally exploded. But this big bang didn't form the universe. Rather, a figure emerged, a furry giant called Pungu. Pungu saw nothing but darkness and chaos, but he had an axe, which he swung. The chaos split in two the dark and heavy stuff going down to form the earth, and the light and clear stuff going up to form the sky. This is represented in the yin-yang. Pungu pushed these two spheres apart for 18,000 years until, tired, he sat down. Sleeping, his breath became the wind and his snores the thunder. His left eye became the sun and his right the moon, while his limbs became the cardinal directions. His muscles became mountains and valleys, his veins the rivers and seas. His tears became the rain and his fur became the trees. And where do animals come from? Fleas. There were fleas from a giant called Pangu. In the lead up to Easter, I swapped reading time for egg colouring time and we decorated dozens of egg-shaped ping-pong balls with zigzag lines or scary eyes. I hung them with little wires onto a wall display and we stood back marvelling at Grade One's latest achievement. I decided to treat the class to an Easter egg hunt on Friday afternoon at the teacher's choice slot. What a mistake that was. On Thursday evening, while watching some gothic drama on Jess's laptop, I designed a pirate map. It approximated a bird's eye view of the school, complete with a golden compass, skull and crossbones, and an X marking the spot, or spots. I planned to take the kids' eggs, 30 or so, and split them up into four bags and leave them at different locations near the running track up trees, behind walls, in flower beds and such. Bright and early the next day, I printed the map in the International Department office and soaked it in some coffee in the foreign teacher's lounge, an old trick taught to all aspiring salty sea dogs in their youth. I left it on the windowsill, where a pleasant spring sun began to give it an authentic, olden days look. I only hoped that Class 1 would be as excited as I was. I coordinated my plan with co-teacher Qian, who pliantly agreed as ever. After the normal boring classes of the morning, she and the kids marched off to lunch. One, two, hands up, three, four, hands down, go. Once they'd rounded the corner, I snapped into action and made to steal the eggs. With an evil chuckle, I picked off the eggs from the wall, split them into the bags. Then, keen to join the class at lunch before someone suspected my evil plan, I quickly dropped them off at the locations in the map and made my way to the canteen. Often we teachers sat together at lunch, but occasionally we'd join our classes. They never failed to amaze me what a treat this was for the students. They were endlessly amused by the foreigner eating tofu or slurping oily soup. They'd laugh and smile at me with uneaten rice still in their mouths. It was disgusting. While the Chinese teachers stopped them from getting overexcited or throwing things on the floor, I was there for fun, and fun alone. The canteen was a microcosm for the whole English teaching shtick. Place almost empty, Qian was beginning to organise the class for the long march back to the classroom, but I was getting anxious, and decided to slip out to check on the eggs. They were the kids' most recent pride and joy, and the hurt of actually genuinely losing them would be more acute than any fun had on the egg hunt. If, God forbid, 
a groundskeeper had come across them and... One, two, quick, march! I swept the scene and found, to my horror, two bags of eggs missing. I scanned the fields, from the basketball courts to the classroom blocks, no sign of anyone. Shit, 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 shit. My phone was out and I was calling Yun, jogging towards her classroom, trying to compose myself. For Easter, we decorated eggs. Today I hid them around the playground. But they're gone. Someone's nicked them. Nicked, she said. Taken. Oh, is this a slang word? Nicked, she repeated. I was sensing that the gravity of the situation was not being acknowledged. Yuan, two bags of colourfully decorated eggs are missing. Can you help me find them? Qian is coming back from lunch with the kids. We don't have much time. I'll send out a message on QQ. I thanked her and hung up. I bet real pirates never had to deal with this kind of shit, I thought. Within a few minutes I was outside my class. They weren't back yet. I went into Qian's class and found that Yun had made the cunning move of phoning Qian and delaying their return. Now that's more like it. The QQ message was out, and all we could do was wait. Yun reassured me that if the eggs are gone, there will be tears. That much I knew. But they will get over it, she said. And those kids really like me. They liked me more than Teacher Kelly, she said. With a certain dread, I did the rounds, finding no eggs in the classrooms of Kelly, Jess, Arizona Man, and Mark. I was thankfully spared the humiliation and the inevitable lecture from Dodie because the phone rang and the eggs had been found. I marched up to the fifth floor, non-international department, where the kids all wore red uniforms and were decidedly rough when compared to the angels we nurtured downstairs. I barged through the door with a certain air of impatience. A teacher I didn't know, but was apparently called Joyce, was there with... Two plastic bags of eggs and a big grin. Where were the culprits? Tell me they haven't already walked the plank. The girls found them in the trees, she said, pointing to the two girls standing at the back. They must have been about twelve, unsure whether to test my resolve with a giggle. You just try it. I took the eggs, thanked Joyce, and made my way back down, mumbling to myself about, if you find eggs in a tree, then surely they belong in the tree. I made a beeline for the hiding places, swept the grounds to make sure no other eggs had been snatched in the meantime, and went back to class. The kids were all back, oblivious to how close we'd all come to disaster. The gig was back on. I stood at the front of the class and did my usual teacher spiel, talking about how this afternoon we're going to be practicing our vows and... Wait, what's this? Who's taken the eggs? Cue the gasps. No one had noticed the empty display to my right where the eggs should be. No egg, Daniel said. Eggs, I corrected. Adam, where is egg? Asked Lucy. Eggs, I corrected. Where are eggs? Where are the eggs? No egg, said another. Hang on, what's this? I raised my hand in a plea for silence. On my desk I'd found something. A map, it seemed, left by the thief. I held it aloft and stuck it onto the projector so that everyone could see. As I explained that this appeared to be evidence that pirates had stolen the eggs, Tony One began running around his table going, yes, 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 yes. Using the map, we deduced that the eggs were located all around the running track, perhaps near the viewing platforms or the trees. With this knowledge, we set forth on our quest and all hell broke loose. The intention that we'd swan from X to X, consulting the map like explorers as we roamed, went completely out the window, for as soon as we got to the bottom of the stairs, the kids lost their marbles entirely and ran off in all directions. Qian, happy to leave this hour in my hands, smiled as our class disintegrated. I'm sure half the class forgot about the eggs and just got on with the age-old, kiddie classic of legging it around hysterically. Only Max, Emma and Alice stuck with me earning themselves some serious brownie points by doing so. They will go far, if any pirates steal their eggs in the future. Over the next half hour or so, we found eggs, played it, swung on the monkey bars, took selfies and generally had a silly time. To great relief, no eggs were lost and in the end it was a risk worth taking. It was undiluted joy having fun with those rascals. 
and all the more precious, and in a certain way subversive, that no one was controlling things. This is China. They were so rare for these kids. I have no doubt that my best contribution to those kids' lives was just to embrace those moments of freedom, be themselves, and care for each other. Heck, any old dipshit could speak English with them. An app could teach them English. If we're good for anything, it's bringing a little perspective to an education system which, for all its pros, is knee-deep in cons. With the foreign devil's holiday over, it was the Chinese turn, and a whole new opportunity to learn new beliefs and eat new food. Qingming is in early April, and it's similar to Easter in that its central concern is death and rebirth. But instead of celebrating the Son of God, this one celebrates everyone. As with many an old yarn, the origin story of the festival is a tale of honour, sacrifice and remorse. But this one has a bonus lesson. It serves as a yearly infomercial about the dangers of playing with fire. In the 7th century BC, during the famed spring and autumn period, a duke was in trouble. His crown was in jeopardy, he was on the run, and what's more, he was hungry. His lowly assistant, Jie Zi Tui, cut off a piece of his own leg and offered it to the duke to ward off the stomach cramps. The duke survived, and 19 years later he was back on the throne. One day, it dawned on him that he never thanked Jie for the tasty morsel of inner thigh that had saved his life. He took his men and trekked out to the forest, where Jie now lived with his mother. But Jie could not be found. So to encourage them out of the forest, Jie had his men set the trees alight, and Jie and his mother were duly incinerated. This must have been an incredibly awkward turn of events, although not entirely unpredictable. The duke was mortified that he had repaid Jie's honourable gesture by burning him and his mother to death, so he decided to put things right. He decreed that this solemn day be remembered by not using fire, so only cold food could be eaten. This became Han Shi Day, the cold food festival, and some communities have, over the years, extended the fire ban to much longer periods of time. But I imagine that in northern China, two and a half millennia ago, during these cold days, there might have been a few tuts in the village because the duke burned his forgotten friend alive in the forest and blames the fire for it. Well, after this disaster, the duke noticed that the land was replenishing. It was a springtime miracle. The air was clear and bright, and Qingming means clear, bright, to reflect this happy turn of events. Traditionally, this day, the 15th day after the spring equinox, is thought to be the finest day in the year, weather-wise. Hundreds of years later, the place where Jie and his mother died were renamed Jie Xiu, or Jie's Rest. It's up in Shanxi province. Chinese use this festival to visit their deceased relatives in their places of burial, where they clean their tombstones as a sign of respect. The food most associated with the festival is Qing Tuan, sweet green dumplings which look slightly radioactive. People also burn joss paper and fake money so their deceased ancestors have something to spend during their lengthy stay in the afterlife. Qingming only recently became a national holiday in China to give people the chance to take the trip, which is as busy and as chaotic as any moment in China where people take to the road. As Xi Jinping ramps up nationalism, it's not inconceivable that this holiday could be warped into a kind of patriotic Fallen Heroes Day instead of a more personal Fallen Relatives Day. So watch this space. And next time I'm stuck in the Middle Kingdom with you, I head to a water town called Jinxi, but look west towards the source of the water, Tibet. <laughs>